Oh, oh. Yeah, we're live. We're live. There you go. All righty. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first live stream book chat with an author. Um, so welcome all of you to the Isn't It Romantic book club. I'm Abby Rhodes and I write dark romantic thrillers. This is my Fatal Dream series and this is my Fatal Truth series. So if you like your romance dark and dangerous, my books are for you. <laughs> And I'm Sharon Ray. I um, write romantic suspense. I wrote the Deadly Force series. And the third book in the series just came out on Tuesday. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. And I am Jenny Marks. And I write uh, Western uh, romance. Just came out on Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. Technical difficulty. Uh, I write Western romance. I write cozy mysteries. I write romantic comedy. Um, my latest series is the Cowboys of Credence, my hockey playing cowboys, and all these little cutie pies. They're adorable. They're so I'm cute. Not very good at this, but um, and tonight I am showing a book cover release. Uh, what do you call it? Cover cover reveal. Cover reveal. <laughs> you can actually see this is my new cover, and I'm starting a new series that's um, a horse rescue series, and this is a cowboy. It's gorgeous. Beautiful. I love it, Jenny. <laughs> it's a okay. horse too. So there you go. Um, I'm Diana Mignot Stewart. I write romantic suspense for the strong heart. Um, my uh, <laughs> I was gonna say bad legacy. That's the next series coming out. Uh, my Black Ops Confidential series includes I Am Justice, The Price of Grace, and The Cost of Honor. Um, it's about a secret society of vigilantes that travel the globe righting wrongs against women. I have that one down. So my next series is the Bad Legacy series, and we'll talk more about what we're working on at the end. But we're here for Kate Ballinger and to talk about her book, Wicked Cowboy Wolf. So we're going to bring Kate on in one second. I just want to introduce her really quick. Kate Ballinger is the award-winning and best-selling author of the Seven Ring Shifter Paranormal Romance Series, where she weaves captivating tales of dark, sexy heroes who are cowboys by day, wolf shifters by night. When Kate's not preoccupied writing intense and riveting paranormal plots or high-voltage love scenes that make even seasoned romance readers blush and romance writers, uh, she can usually be found spending time with her family or with her nose buried in a good book. She lives in Florida with her husband and two young sons. Welcome, Kate. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. We're so excited you're here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so you've been hanging around the group for a month now, and you've seen us you know, talking about pigs and cowboys and bad boys versus cinnamon buns and cinnamon <laughs> buns and wicked cowboy wolf for those who haven't read it yet. <laughs> yeah, he's rogue is a is a bad, bad boy. Like don't yeah. even think that he's not. Like just when you think, well he's not so bad, he does something, you're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you are bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and you know, he earned the wicked cowboy wolf title, right? For that reason. Because you know, every time I tried to like do something redeeming with it the him, he would just turn around and do something horrible again. I know, I know. And even when you were in his point of view and you knew why he was doing it, you're just like Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's the definitely, um, you know, I tend to write bad boys um, in most of my books, but he's definitely um, probably the baddest of all of them that I've written. He's like one bad. I don't know. I, I like his level of bad, but then, um, you know, he, he ends up being kind of a softy at the very, very end in his own little way. <laughs> no, he definitely does. And I think that um, Maverick is kind of, I mean, they're all kind of, you know, have the alpha male thing going on. So Maverick is who the next book is about? Yes. Yeah. So I am finishing up Maverick's book um, right now. And Ooh. his book has been a long time coming. Because when I first um, started writing the series and when I was working on Wes's book, um, the book one, Cowboy Wolf Trouble, um, 
<laughs> you know, I had plans that Maverick was going to be book two, and then the characters ran away with the story. And then we have Colt in um, book two, and then we have Rogue in book three. And so now I'm finally <laughs> getting around to Maverick. So, um, so his book has been a long time in the making. <laughs> you know, one of our um, book club members, uh, Tamara Kaysen, asked, um, who comes after Maverick? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I never, you know, I try to plan these things out, um, but then things go haywire, right? Um, <laughs> the characters don't listen to me. So when, like, for example, when I was writing Colt's book, um, book two in the series, Cowboy and Wolf's Clothing, um, again, Maverick was supposed to be book three. I keep putting Maverick in there and he never was happening. And then Rogue just came onto the page at the end of book two and, you know, made a brief appearance as a secondary character. And he was just so charismatic that I was like, I can't not write this character's book, right? Like I'd be miserable writing another character at this point if I didn't write Rogue. And so I had to just go ahead and run with it and take care of his book. Um, there's sort of two possibilities as I'm writing book four right now. Blaze, who has been a character throughout the series and a secondary um, character frequently um, comes to mind as a possibility for the next hero. That's who I intend for it to be. But then there's like this other secondary character that's popping up now uh, that readers haven't met yet, who's kind of being a little bit like rogue and being troublesome. So I don't know, maybe his book, but we'll see when I get there. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's good to know that you're working. You have something in the works anyway. Yes. Yes. There's <laughs> definitely more books in the series on the way. So. Oh, awesome. Uh, did anybody else want to ask a question before I run away with everything? <laughs> yeah. If any of your readers have any questions, just type them in the comments and we'll get to them. Um, I have a question, Kate. Um, you write, I mean, this was clearly a Beauty and the Beast story, but it's also a reunion story. Was there an inspiration for combining those two tropes into one book? I mean, because you typically find one or the other. I don't know that there was a an inspiration for combining them other than the fact that I really love both tropes. <laughs> so, um, my my goal as a writer right, is always to be writing a book that I would really love to read. So like if I don't enjoy a trope, I'm obviously not going to try writing it um, because I feel like if I were to write something I didn't enjoy, that would come across. And so I love um, reunion stories. I love mistaken identity and I love Beauty and the Beast sort of um, themes. And so um, this book, I just decided I was going to go out all out and I was going to put every one of my favorite tropes in this book. Wow. So it was kind of just because I really love those things and wanted to mash them together and see if it worked. <laughs> yeah, well, it worked. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, and there was one scene like um, when they were leaving that coyote bar and she got, you know, tussled up with the two guys. And then all of a sudden Rogue comes on the scene and that like paragraph when she first sees him standing there with like his, only his scars were visible. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like I could totally see that in a movie. Oh, like that, like yeah. just that imagery of his hat and the, but like the only side, the scarred side of his face, the only one that's showing, I was like, wow, that one gave me chills. Oh, like, thanks. Mm -hmm. you know, I see it kind of visually in my head. I know there's been that thing going around the internet right about how whether people like are you know visual thinkers or whether they have like an internal narrator in their head well i have no internal narrator right but especially when i'm writing you know it comes to me like a movie right and so a lot of people have yeah. called the books in this series very cinematic and i and i think part of that is because the cowboys right are really I mean, they're like real cowboys, but they're a little bit more like old west, wild west cowboyish. Um, so I think that might be a part of it. But I would love to see the books in the movie someday. Yeah. Fingers crossed, right? Wouldn't we all love to see our books yeah. in the movies, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll talk on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll jump in on that because um, I'm also uh, like I see it as a a movie there too. So. Um, 
cowboy shifters. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about, tell the readers a little bit about how you came up with the idea to combine those two things. Yeah, so um, I had been writing another paranormal romance series for Carla Quinn um, called The Execution Underground, which actually takes place in the same universe as the Seven Rain Shifter books. And um, that series is about humans who hunt supernatural creatures. So I was actually writing more about humans than I was about the creatures themselves, right? And um, so when I was starting this series, I knew I wanted to do something that was more like paranormal creature centric. And um, I love wolves. I've always loved reading about shifters, right? So that was obviously at the top of my mind. But then, you know, paranormal tends to be a hard market. And so it was the question of how do you make this something that is different from every other shifter book out there, right? And so the question came up, of, well, why would um, werewolves, why do they live in cities in like every werewolf movie or book, right? They live in like New York or Chicago or like just on the New Year's, Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, and I was like, well, that's not, you know, that doesn't make sense to me because actual wolves live out in Montana, right? Like out in the West. And so it was kind of the idea that okay, well, if they're living out west and they're out in the middle of nowhere, they've got to make their living somehow. So they're going to be ranchers, right? So the idea sort of solidified from there. Yeah, it's very logical. But you know what is not very logical is how May is a vegetarian. I know. <laughs> no, no, that is not very logical, right? And, and totally doesn't make sense because she like. I don't think I go into this, but she would probably like eat meat when she's in wolf form, but not in human form, which makes no sense, but it kind of works with her character because she's just like this tender heart at the beginning for sure. And and I was very much trying to contrast her with Rogue and I have a lot of fun um, making the characters kind of have that back and forth banter. So I was like, what could make him really annoyed with her since he's like this cowboy, right? in this rancher and oh yeah, she doesn't eat meat. Right. <laughs> okay, but that leads into Tucker. Yes. Yes, I love so Tucker. You yes. have to tell us all about Tucker, and you gave me a hint and said Tucker was based on a real life teacup pig. So I want to hear all about it. Yes, yes. So a sort of teacup pig. So when yeah. I was in um, high school, right, so this requires some backstory, is that um, my mother is the type of person who she will take in any stray animal that comes across her path. So we always had like a menagerie of all sorts of crazy animals in our household growing up. Like at one point we had like five pugs and like three cats, right? So this gives you kind of an idea of my childhood. And when I was in high school, um, somebody knew, right, decided that they had this little what they called at the time a teacup pig that they needed to rehome right and so of course the moment my mother heard this she's like well we're getting a teacup pig right <laughs> So the teacup pig um, comes home to my parents' house, and his name is Tucker, right? So this is based okay. on a real pig. And he's very cute and adorable at first, right? And he, and he lives among our dogs just fine. <laughs> and then it wasn't until, like, a couple months later that we realized, okay, like, he's about the size of a pot belly now, not a teacup pig, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then he just kind of kept on growing from okay. there. And so that's when we learned that there's no <laughs> thing as teacup pigs, right? I know. I <laughs> so they are either like teacup pigs, as people know them, are either micro pigs that have been underfed very cruelly. Mm -hmm. Right, very unfortunate. Or they are just piglets of like a pot belly breed that will eventually turn into a pot belly. Well, in Tucker's case, he was a full sized, like full grown hog. He's still living. My parents still have him. Luckily, they have a fair amount of property, right? So he has this big pig pen all to himself in their like, yard, right? Um, yeah, so Tucker is real. And I learned that teacup pigs are not a thing. And so that's kind of like, I think it comes up at some point later in the book when Rogue starts to say like, is he getting bigger, right? And she's like, shut your mouth, right? Because 
I, it just had to be one more thing, right? That he would yeah. be like, there's no such thing as two cup pigs. And she's just gullible enough to fall for this. Well, and it's funny because when I was reading it, I was like, there's no such thing as a teacup pig. You yeah. know, and I kept thinking that, that like, how, how does she, how does she, how, this can't be real. And then finally, when it got to the scene where Rogue says that, like, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, and well, and, and it was a, like, at that point, I needed him to just be a little not nice, yeah. right? So I was like, okay, this has got to be the moment where he tells her, May, teacup pigs don't exist. Right, right. right. And everybody well, I'm like, on the Gray Wolf Ranch loves her too much to have told her this. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't want to break her heart. Aww. Well, I no. love Tucker so much. I called my son. He's at um, he's a pre-veterinary student at Virginia Tech. I called him. I said, "Can we get a teacup pig? Do you know what that is?" He started laughing so hard. <laughs> I was like, "Mom, because there's no such thing." I'm like, no. "I know there is. It's in this book." <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, is a lot of people are like crazy in love with Tucker at the beginning of the book, and then they're like, "I want a teacup pig," and then they get to that moment and they're just as crushed as me. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, Kate, that what is so funny is in this new book that is coming out of mine, this Cowboy State of Mind. Mm -hmm. It's about a horse rescue ranch, but these two women show up in the middle of the book from Kansas. They've driven all night because the the 16 year old daughter got a little pot belly pig. Someone sold her this little pig and then it just kept growing and growing and growing. And so they didn't know what to do with this giant 200 pound hog, but they weren't allowed to call it a hog because it thought it was a dog. And <laughs> your mom is like in my book. She just yes. like. <laughs> That's so funny. Yes, that, that was exactly what happened to us. And there was like a debate at some point once he started getting big enough that we're like, well, we can't keep him in the house anymore. Right. And yeah. so it was like, what do we do with him? And so finally it was just the, the decision that we were going to keep him. Right. Because there was debate over whether we needed to send him to a bigger farm or whatever but luckily like I said my parents have enough property that they were able to create a little pin for him and they have chickens and and dogs and all sorts of crazy animals over there like well, kids show up in my book Tucker right that like <laughs> going to see grandma's pig and her chickens is like a big highlight for my two sons oh, <laughs> I feel like that gauntlet has been thrown now I gotta find a way to put a pig in one of my books out <laughs> <laughs> And my pig is called Tiny, but he's really, he's really just this giant pig that sneaks in the house all the time because she thinks she's a dog. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Hey, Kate, do you have a favorite scene in the book? Mm. Uh, so I, I really love the scene where... Um, Maeve goes into the library in the middle of the night and wrote there and he's like reading a book or whatever and he's got his whiskey, yeah. right? And it gets very dark and emotional between them. And like when I wrote, like you all have probably had moments like this, right? Where I wrote the last line of that scene where he says this something about like there's not enough whiskey in this decanter to ch chase the demons away or whatever. And I was like, Oh, I impressed myself with that one. <laughs> I was so happy with that line. So I guess that's like like my darling of the book, I guess. Uh, so I love that scene just because it's kind of like a tender moment between them in the fact that they're exchanging, you know, information that's, you know, sort of close to their heart, but then you know, it's kind of brooding and tortured too. So, and who doesn't love a sexy cowboy in a library? <laughs> well, and right. what right. a gorgeous library. I like I had like the, the Beauty and the Beast library in my mind, you That's know. Like, that was really what I was going for. Yeah. So like, if she were Belle and she was coming into mm -hmm. that gorgeous like library, what would this look like? Cause yeah. that, that's where I would want to find a cowboy wolf. Oh yeah. <laughs> We all would. Exactly. <laughs> well, see, I'm a librarian. I've always wanted to work in a library like that. I never have. My libraries have never looked like Bell's library. <laughs> no, my, my husband's a librarian, and I think he would agree with you. <laughs> like, he's always <laughs> <wanted> <laughs> <one day. laughs> well, You know what? The fact that he said that line about there's not enough whiskey in this decanter to chase away my demons is so true of his character as we watch him 
go through this book, like it almost seems like he's, you know, self-sabotaging, like, you know, he doesn't feel like he's good enough for her and he creates barriers. Yes. It, oh, I definitely think he's self-sabotaging. Right. And like, and even at the end of the book, right. I don't, I don't even know that he's like, because it's up until the very last moment, right, that he has to pull things together and realize I can't go through with this. Yeah, you know, I can't I can't do this to her and her family and her pack, right? And so I feel like he's self sabotaging up until that very last moment, and it's only his love for her, right, that makes him not, you know, sort of ruin things. And I, you know. And I, I really like the um, the sort of happily ever after dynamic with them at the end because she sort of acknowledges right that he's still not quite perfect right he he's yeah. not the hero that you think he should be typically by the end of the book but he's gonna he's gonna work on it right so <laughs> but but yeah. he grew in his arc and he is enough redeeming qualities especially the interactions with the orphan children that were you know so tender i thought those were some of my favorite scenes yeah i i definitely needed a way to showcase that he was sort of a champion for the underdog right and um and i figure you know i have two small sons and so i was like well what causes like a lot of havoc in somebody's life right is like kids so of course if he's going to champion the underdog and he's going to protect the vulnerable you know who's more vulnerable than these like orphan rogue wolf children right they wouldn't have a pack they wouldn't have anyone to protect them so he's got to take them in and i was like and he's going to have all these moments where he gets to be super sweet and we see this other side of him where he's not quite such a badass right like <laughs> so, oh, go ahead, Abby. Abby I'm sorry um I was just gonna ask like if you had actors who were gonna play Rogue and Maeve in a movie like who would they be so um Rogue appearance wise is very, very heavily inspired um, by uh, Cillian Murphy in his role playing Tommy in the Peaky Blinders. Anybody watch that show? I, I was just I watching it two hours ago. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I Tommy, yeah. Oh, so Cillian Murphy. I got chills thinking about Tommy being him. Yes, he's so sexy. And I was like, mm. oh, he's such a badass, right? Oh, and I'm like, if you put him in like a long trench coat and like a cowboy hat, yes, right? Mm -hmm. and so like I used to listen to the part of the intro to that show, Red Right Hand, mm -hmm. right? I used to listen to that if I needed to get inspired to write Rogue's book because I was like, that's who I would have. Oh, I totally see it because I have, I, I even downloaded Red Right Hand because yeah. I love that song so much, yeah. Yes, I, I do. totally see it, totally see it. Yeah, yeah. So that's why he's described as like having that little bit of like an undercut because I was uh -huh. like, well, you know, okay, let's make him a little bit different. So that's who I would imagine as Rogue. I don't, I don't typically come up with um, guides for my female characters as much. You know, I think about what they look like, and and I know that May would be somewhat pixie-ish and smaller in size, but I I find it hard to like pinpoint the models because I guess. And maybe this is bad of me, right? But I want the heroes to be like super duper sexy, but I want the women to be just kind of like average people, right? I want the I want the regular girl to get her her HEA. So so I don't quite look up the heroines and like figure out what they look like as much. I think the only heroine that I did that with was Naomi, um, who is the heroine of um book one and um i really wanted sort of a basis for her because um so she's native american and um and i was writing outside of my own culture right and so i wanted to find a really sort of beautiful native american actress that i could um base her on and so i wanted to kind of get down to the details of really what she looked like but so i don't have anyone for me but rogue would definitely be cillian murphy <laughs> so totally see it uh, Han Hannah Robertson said Rogue is her absolute favorite of your heroes. Thank you. Um, so 
I know like writers are not supposed to pick favorites, right? Cause they're like our children, but you know, it's, I don't think it's a secret to say he's my favorite too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see your favorite book? But most of the readers in my reader group know that like, as I was writing this, I was like, you guys, I like, I love this character. I love this book. I'm having so much fun with it. Right. And, and you know, there's a certain, now that I'm writing Maverick's book, of course, the one I'm working on is always my favorite, right? But but Rogue is a very special character to me. I had so much fun writing that book. You can definitely tell. Sharon, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I did. My, um, I was just, it's a little more of an author question, but you know, writing a series is hard, and choosing who to put in each book is hard. And when you in, are in the middle of a series, did you, do you struggle with, you know, because people love the characters of the previous books, but that you also want to introduce them to the characters that will be in the new books. How do you balance not having a cast of thousands in each book? You know yeah, I mean? uh, that, that is very difficult. So, um, so I think the way I managed to get away from that in, in book three, in Rogue's book, is simply just because with them being away from the Grey Wolf Ranch for so much of it, right, we were able to introduce this whole other cast of secondary characters who had not come into the picture before. Um, and now in book four, right, that we're back on the Grey Wolf Ranch um, and we're very much entrenched there, right? Because it's Maverick's book. Of course, he's going to be on the Grey Wolf Ranch. He's the pack master. Um, so I'm kind of getting into that struggle of bringing in new characters that I want to be, you know, potential heroes or heroines later on in the series and keeping the ones that everyone loves. So I kind of have this scene that takes place almost in the middle of the book where, um, all of the Grey Wolf elite warriors are together, right, for this sort of lunar ceremony that the pack participates in. And um, so we get to see the old characters that we love, and then we get introduced to these new characters. And the intention, right, is that sort of after that point, the older characters kind of fade into the background a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, because as much as I love, like, say, Wes or Colt, um, from the earlier books or even Rogue, if they keep coming up over and over again, like I'm not gonna have room for new characters. So I've kind of made a conscious decision that from that point on, they might be mentioned in passing, but we might not see as much of them on the page because we have to make room for those new characters, which I hope is not like making my readers freak out, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's so hard. Your, your readers want more books about the people they already know. Yeah, yeah. Heard. And I, and I think the way that I'm planning to like address that is um, I want to do a lot more like, um, like either short stories or novellas specifically for my newsletter subscribers. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm totally not against the idea of going back and revisiting those couples and like short stories or that sort of thing and making that like content just for my newsletter people. So. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, I also think that like if you bring in the old characters too much, then readers kind of get like, then they feel like they have to read the books in order. Yeah. You know? And right. I would rather them be able to each one read as a standalone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because I just think if I bring too much of the previous people in, then they, they just get locked into that idea that I have to read this in order. And so I try yeah. to be very minimal. Yeah, that's that's very true. And I and I try to be conscious of that in each book because, you know, there there's some things you do want to cross over. So then there is like an experience to reading each book in the series. But at the same time, you don't want so much crossover that people can't pick it up at book three right. or they right. can't pick it up at book four. Right. And right. that it's particularly complicated when you're doing these paranormal elements, right. That require this like gradual world building. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm managing that. I, I wish I could say I had like some uh, technique or like advice on how to do that, but I'm kind of doing it by the seat of my pants. <laughs> if I'm honest. Well, do you feel more confident with your world building now? I mean, now you're into, you know, a couple books. So do you feel more confident? Um, I suppose so. I'm, I'm, I still, I, I'm still a seat of the pants writer, right? Mm -hmm. So I had no idea sort of 
the ways in which I was going to fully expand this world when I wrote book one. And I found that what's working for me so far is that like, so I expand it just a little bit more with each book in the series. And I think that's worked out well because since not everything is explained in books one and two and even three, right? There's still some things that are sort of left to an element of mystery that gives me room to play. And I haven't yeah. sort of boxed myself into a corner. But I do have a series Bible now that had to happen before I wrote book three because I was like, there's so many details. I'm going to lose them all. Wow. Series Bible. Now, I, I don't have one. I have <laughs> one. You ladies have series Bible? Oh, I do. Well, I, have one. I made my own wiki page for mine. Oh, you did? I have a private Wikipedia page. for, And it keeps track of – and I love it because I can put all the links in it, list all the characters. Every character has a page. Kate, is yours um, electronic or is it paper? So um, mine is like in almost like this really fancy Word doc. Um, so, but I I might actually at some point put it out for my newsletter subscribers to see just because there's like interesting little notes about the characters in there, um, which I don't know whether that's something readers would be interested in or not, but it seems like the sort of behind the scenes stuff that a lot of readers are really into. Um, I know I would love to see that for series that I love. So um, that's the plan of what I'm going to do with it right now. But it's, um, it's kind of like a big PDF file at the moment. So you just have to be careful that you don't have spoilers in there. Like you need to make sure that what you're sharing, because right. I have tons of spoilers. Yes. Yeah. I, I have to watch, right. That it doesn't sort of cross over. So what I've been doing is like each time I finish a book in the series, right. I go back in and put stuff into the series Bible. So then that way it's like, okay, only the books that have released have the information in the series Bible. And then the other stuff I keep like kind yeah. of separate thing. So, so yes. Lisa, oh, I'm sorry. I, we have a question. Uh, Lee Chapini, she says, I love the covers. Sorry, Lee, I don't mean to laugh at your question, but do you get to choose how you want the cover to look? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at us all <laughs> laughing. Who doesn't love a guy with like gorgeous six pack abs and like a really nice cowboy hat? Yeah. Of course, they're they're amazing covers. But um, so Source Books is the one who is in charge of my covers, and um, all of you, right, being fellow Source Books authors, know we get sort of a um, sort a document, right, that we're supposed to send materials of like, well, who do you think this character would look like, and tell us about the feeling of the book or whatever. Um, but you know. Some of that gets listened to, I think. No, um, it doesn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I will say they're they're good about like so all my heroes always have to have tattoos, right? I'm like, if they're bare chested guys on my cover, they gotta have tats. So they're good about always doing that. Um, you know, and but they kind of have their formula, right? Of the of hot guy uh with wolf superimposed in the background, right? Uh, which oh, yeah. we're but you know it's it's the books in the series. So I did get a little say um, with Rogue's cover, right? When um, when I put in that's beautiful. Um, beautiful. Material. Thank you. Yeah, they did a great job with that. I, I really just when they sent it, I was like, right. <laughs> I had a moment right with the cover, <laughs> but um, I I had to make clear to them right with Rogue being so severely scarred that either the scarring needed to be on the cover or his face needed to be shadowed and blacked out. Mm. So that was a big note um, in the art information that I sent over to source books, and I was really pleased that they did that because it would have probably annoyed readers, right? If you had seen mm -hmm. Rogue's face on the cover, he was not scarred since it's such a plot point in the book, but they were very good about accommodating that, which I appreciated. Well, um, Tamara says short stories would be awesome. And Hannah says, Yes, she would love a peek at the series Bible. Oh, I'm glad, to do that. <laughs> I'm, glad I'm glad to know I'm like on to the right thinking, right? Of like, what are the readers wanting? <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Um, well, you know, I have a question that's um, more of like an author 
process question. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your process. And I have a question about your desk because one thing that I do not show is ever my desk because <laughs> my husband cannot work until he has a clean desk. I have to work and I don't think my desk has ever been clean. So talk about like your writing process. Do you have to have everything in place? Is your desk immaculate? Do you have stacks everywhere? Like tell us a little bit about your writing process. So my desk mirrors my writing process in the sense that when I start the book, the desk has to be like totally clean. Everything is in order. And then by the time the book is finished, I would never show anyone but my family members that desk because it is so messy, <laughs> right? So it is a process of cleaning off the desk before the start of every book because otherwise I would never find anything. But by the time I get to the end of the deadline and I'm like sending the book off to my agent and then to my editor, right? Like. That, and then I know that the desk is just an explosion. <laughs> nice. So it, it's like the clutter of my of my brain of like I've got all these ideas that I suddenly have to tie together somehow ends up going on to the desk. <laughs> well, with your clean desk, do you have like absolute silence? Do you need silence to write or? I do typically need silence to write, um, which is hard to find when you have um, two children under the age of five in your household. <laughs> silence is hard to come by, but uh, luckily um, my husband is very, very helpful and supportive. So on his days off, he'll sort of take the kids. And then um, just this year, right, I, I had been writing in kind of an office space in our house but then um when my second son was born he took that and made it his nursery right so i no longer had an office um, and um so we just managed to put up like a she shed in our yard which is great like so i have uh, this separate little shed i'm not in it right now because the internet connection is better in here um so i'm actually in the house at the moment but i love my little she shed because it's nice and quiet though of course my oldest son who is just about to turn five has figured out that he can run out into the backyard and knock on the door right, and be like, mom, mom, you know, um, so, so it's not always super quiet, but it's you have electricity in your she shed. I do. So, so it's not wired completely, but it's close enough to sort of where our house is that we have like this super long extension <laughs> that runs out. And it probably looks very redneck or I guess cowboyish, right? Like, so I'm ready cowboy. <laughs> I think that's something you can only do in Florida. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. You can only do it in Florida because if we were up north, because I'm originally from Michigan, right? So if it right. were in Michigan, it would not, not work. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your hours writing? Do you write the same hours every day or is it whenever you can? Um, it not always the same hours every day. I mean, so my husband's schedule is kind of wonky and sometimes it changes. And since I get the most writing done when he's home and he can take the boys, um, yeah, it's, it's always, uh, a situation of I'm writing whenever I can, but I get the most done, right. Um, he's home from work on Fridays and Sundays are his days off. And so I know if he's got a day off, right. I can, run out to the shed for a little while and just like get a whole ton of words done at once, even if I haven't been able to like steadily pace myself throughout the week. Cause I am definitely not one of those writers who writes every day. I wish I could, but I am not. Oh, good for you though, that you get so much done in two days a week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. Yeah. It's hard, but like, it's like, that's the only time it's going to happen occasionally. Right. Once the, once my kids are in bed, if I feel like I've still got enough energy after, after chasing them around for the day, I'll like edit and do things here and there. But um, throughout the week, I'm doing a lot of like promo and like newsletter stuff and that sort of thing. And then Friday and Sunday, it's like, okay, those are the buckle down and put your blinders on and write the book days. Mm, yeah. So when you're um, writing so many books in a series, how do you make not just your female characters, but I guess your female and male leads different. How do you give them each something unique? So that that's something I'm really conscious of because I, I guess I could say if I was trying 
to do any one thing really well in my books, it's characterization, right? Mm -hmm. I tend to think that if you have a book where people really, really love the characters, it can have a, you know, a not so great plot and people will still read it. You know, I, and I'm not saying that I want my plots to not be good, right? I want everything in the book to be good, of course. Right. Uh, but so I know that like characterization, at least for me, is like, you know, sort of the thing on which the whole book hinges. Right. So, um, so I put a lot of thought into that and, and it's actually getting harder with each book in the series. So like when I started writing Maverick's book, book four, um, which right now is called Renegade Cowboy Wolf. Um, so I was like, okay, well, how do I differentiate him from West? Yeah in cold and rogue and um and i really struggled with that at the beginning of this book because you know i'd start to write him one way and then i was like no that's not quite him and it's sort of a process of discovering their voice and, and i think just being cognizant of the fact that i have to make them different right like and solidifying them in my mind and that always probably takes a way longer like thinking process that I should probably take up. And then I'm like, oh, the deadline's getting near. I better like do something on this book now, right? Um, so I, I probably spend way too much time doing character interviews and uh, things of that sort, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jenny, I don't even know how you do it. I mean, 25 books, my <laughs> God. <laughs> I, I mean, we're talking, right? I, I've got three in this series. I'm on book four, and I've got um, four in my Execution Underground series, and I'm just like, okay, how do I make these characters? So I have no idea how you do 25, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> like it gets harder with each book, but you know. Yeah, but you know, we know twenty five different men that are all totally different. That's true. true. That's true. Right. Like so, and Jenny just bases them on people she knows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know many cowboy wolves, so that makes it kind oh, of hard. well. Yeah, it's a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think parts of people I know are definitely in in some of the heroes and heroines for sure though. I think I think we all kind of do that, right? I think so too, yeah. yeah. Kate, uh, how, when you were writing these books, how did you decide of the of the werewolf, werewolf lore? How did you decide what to keep and what to like not worry about? Mm. So it really just goes down to what I like to read, right? Um and so and kind of as I was writing book one, it was really a, pro a process of like, okay, what do I need to happen in this moment? And was kind of using it as a means to an end. And then once that book was done, it was like, it's kind of just built steadily from there. Um, but as far as like some of the mythology of the series, um, I really like when there's some sort of scientific explanation um for why a particular like magical species or that sort of thing exists um and i've always just preferred that in the paranormals that i like to read and so um, i'm delving into that a lot right now in um maverick's book i think we get a little bit more explanation of like where the gray wolves come from and why they're ranchers even and that sort of thing in this book than we have in the previous ones in the series um, and so I just wanted it to be something more than, oh, because it's magic, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the fun part about doing multiple books is you really get to explore a lot more of the world. Yeah, yeah, because in book one, I don't feel like I, I got to delve into that much. It was just sort of what I needed in the moment. And same sort of thing with book two. And it wasn't really until I got to Rogue's book, I think that I started thinking about, okay, how do I solidify this mythology and make them have like a history behind them? Um, because world building is something readers love to read about, right? And But for me, it's one of the things that is, most challenging for me since I'm a seat of the pants sort of writer. Um, I don't plan it ahead. So I've kind of had to try and think about, you know, what I want to do with the later books in the series, which doesn't quite come naturally to me, but it's, it's something I'm working out in Maverick's book because with him being pack master in particular, I think it sort of had to come in his book. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, is there, uh, for paranormal readers, are there certain markers that they're going to want in that book that you know you have to put in there? Mm. 
Well, so we know that it's generally paranormal readers love alpha males, right? So I don't know that you could quite pull off a beta cowboy wolf. Or a <laughs> bun. Yeah. Bun, yeah. Yeah. It, it, as much as I love reading them occasionally in contemporaries, right? Or like, or other, you know, subgenres of romance, I don't know that it lends itself quite as well to paranormal. So I feel mm -hmm. like there's still an expectation among readers that the heroes are very alpha. Um, and that they usually have that sort of brody dark past. Um, okay. and I, and I think that in particular, right, for the heroines, that there's an expectation that they're, um, they're strong enough that they can hold their own with the heroes while still being relatable. But otherwise, I feel like anything sort of goes in paranormal, right? Like we're seeing all sorts of crazy types of shifters in paranormal books right now. Like Shelley Lawrenston has a series out about honey badgers. And I, I was love like, it. I love it. <laughs> right? like, like who thought of that? But it's- The a bears and yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think, your imagination can go anywhere, but there is still an expectation of strong alpha hero and and a heroine who can put him in his place occasionally. <laughs> this has been so this has been so much fun. Yes, this has been so much fun. I wish we could keep talking to you for hours, but we yeah, have we'll see coming up. Well, at Book Lovers Con, we'll talk. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> And for the readers that are watching and you guys that are watching this live, I mean, we're a few weeks away from book lovers and we're all going to be together. And so we're going to have some fun surprises for you for some fun things that we're going to do together. But I think that we are. Um, oh, actually, before I transition out, there's one more question for you. What age is this book rated? Oh, what age? <laughs> so all of my books, you better be 18 or older, <laughs> right? Um, so I write very, very hot romance. And there are some very, very explicit scenes in this one in particular. So um, definitely for older readers, I would say. Now, I was reading pretty raunchy stuff very young. <laughs> right? Me too. Uh, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> we all were. But if you're buying from your kids, that's a different story. I know. <laughs> but yes, I can to clarify it. that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're thinking about letting a teenager of your own child read it, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think that we are ready to transition into our next exciting thing, which uh, right. we're gonna give a little hint as to what our next book is going to be about. Because you know we love to do a hint. We're so ready. Ready. I'm so ready. Ready. Okay, go. Ready? Okay. Yay! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Love our it. next book is The Worst Best Man by Mia Sosa. We're so <laughs> excited for this book. Oh my God. And so, so it's fun. Be so much fun. It's going to be, if it's anything like with this conversation with Kate, it is going to be a blast. Thank you so much, Kate, for being our very first. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yes, we're so glad to I'm excited to read Mia's book too, right? Yeah. I've been wanting to read this one, so I'm pumped. <laughs> yeah, we're all super excited about it. And um, Mia is giving away a copy of her book to someone in, at someone in the group. And uh, Sharon, do talk to us about um, the giveaway. Yes. Okay. So um, how long are we going to leave the video? How long are we going to leave the giveaways? Sunday, I think. Sunday? Okay. So if you're not watching this live, that's totally fine. Um, just uh, up, we'll leave the comments open until Sunday. And then we're doing... Um, including Mia's. Oh, we're, actually, we're doing six giveaways because we have Kate's giveaways. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so Kate is giving away. It's Kate. It's the second book in your series, right? Yes. So I'm. I'll give away a signed copy of Cowboy in Wolf's Clothing. So if you have not read the earlier books in the series, this is a time to that you can win one of the earlier books. Great. I'm going to be giving away um, a copy of the first book in my series, Every Deep Desire, and then Carrie Cole's Hunt the Moon, another paranormal. That's yeah. really wonderful. Carrie was a, another Golden Heart sister of ours. Um, and Abby, what are you going to I'm going to give away a copy of 
figure out, figure out where to put it here. Never let me fall. <laughs> and uh, Susanna Kearsley's name, named of the dragon. I loved that Ooh. book so much. And this one is signed by oh. Susanna. So. Oh yeah, Carrie's a sign too. So oh cool. God, you guys. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyone give it away? So I am going to give away a copy of Caught Up in a Cowboy and a mystery book because I wasn't prepared because I have the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so right. a mystery book will make it sound exciting instead of disorganized. <laughs> it's sort of like, um, you know, date with a book that you see at the bookstore where it yeah. doesn't have the cover. Yeah. <laughs> and Diana, how about you? Uh, so I'm going to give away uh, Jennifer Armentrout's White Hot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to give away the first in my series. Um, I'm Justice. So if you've already read it, you can get the first one and give it to somebody else. And then put uh, Jennifer's book for yourself. Okay. So um, that's six giveaways because Mia is also giving away a copy of her book. So you have until Sunday. Just leave a comment below the video and we'll pick our winners from the commenters. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like we did last time, we're going to throw out some trivia questions just so you all get to know us a little bit better. Um, and because this is a, the next book has a wedding theme, we're going to ask, give you some wedding questions. I will then post them in the, I'll actually do a separate post, I think, maybe with a poll so you can just yeah. pick. Who um, has 200 wedding shoes? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. <Dang it. laughs> oh my God. okay, whose wedding is the day after her husband's birthday? We're Who including was... Kate. We're including Kate in yes, this. We're including yes, five. Yeah, there's, there's five five questions. Um, who got married at 9:30 a.m. in the morning? Who got married on St. Patrick's Day? Who had a potluck reception after her wedding? Who woke up late for her wedding? And then had to eat a hot dog from 7-Eleven on the way to the church. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those are your questions. And, you know. Take your time to think about them. We'll post them all in the group and you know, then we'll let you know. We'll give it a couple of days. We'll give you a chance to really think about it. And then we'll let you know on Sunday, um, you know, who's right. You don't win anything. You just have the knowledge that it's fine. you know us. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be the trivia queen or king. Yeah. If you win something, you just have to comment on this, this video. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I will do... Um, I'll put a separate post up for the trivia questions and which one of us did which. So, yes. and last thing that we just wanted to get to what everyone is working on right now. So Kate, we'll start with you. So I am finishing up the last of uh, book four in the series, Renegade Cowboy Wolf, which is Maverick's book. And then after that, I will have book uh, five and six on my desk. So there will be wow. at least three more books in the series. So I'm excited. <laughs> that is exciting. That is very exciting. Abby? Um, I am just got done with first round edits on Capturing Fate and waiting for second round edits on Capturing Fate. And I'm writing a new series called Minds of Madness, loosely based Ooh. on a, yeah, loosely based on a true crime Love case. that idea. We talked about that last year in New Orleans. <laughs> yes, we did, didn't we? <laughs> we did. Um, I'm working on a novella in the Deadly Force series and book four in the Deadly Force series. And then I have six submissions in with my agent right now. So I'm waiting to see. Wow. Oh, I hope something works out. You got a lot of stuff in the work. That's awesome. Yeah, I just, I couldn't make up my mind. They couldn't make up their minds. And so I just sent them everything. I said, okay, you, you figure it out. Get back to me. <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. Jenny, what are you working on? Um, so I just turned in a book um, Friday, which means in the author world, you get a big, long break of like a day or two and then you start working on your next book yeah and um i have uh signed a deal with hallmark so i Woo! am doing, uh, starting my hallmark book right now and it is called uh rescuing harmony ranch and it's about a city girl of course uh who goes home to help her you know a couple of matchmaking grandmas and um, she's going to help save the, it's about a living history museum. 
uh, kind of farm ranch thing. And she's got to go home and save the ranch. And of course, you know, the guy that she left behind is the blacksmith. So it's kind of forged in fire, kind of blacksmith. Ooh. So anyway, so I'm working on my next, my homework book. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. And I'm working on, I think I've told everybody a million times, the first book of my new uh, series, the Bad Legacy series, it's called Broken Promises. And I actually should have a cover reveal in like the next week. And I'm super excited about it. So it's, uh, it's basically, it's a second chance romance, but uh, the mystery, thriller, suspense uh, element of it is that there is a serial killer that is targeting specific women and these women um, get together and decide, let's find this guy. Oh, I like <laughs> it. I'm waiting for him to pick us off. Let's find him. So I love it. I love that. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, that's what we're all working on. And I'm so excited for all of our books coming out. And uh, Jenny's yours is in, you have one in June, right? June. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Sharon's is this week. So, Sharon just heard. Yeah, Sharon. Yeah, congratulations. Right Sharon. congratulations. Happy book birthday. And I also want to remind you all, um, who's ever in this group, if you're coming to Book Lovers Con, let us know. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to do a um, get together. Yeah. Yeah. Direct message us. Let us know. Drop us a line. And yeah, we'll get together and we will, you know, chat and hang out. It'll be a ball. Definitely. And we'll be doing lots of videos there too and, and posting things and pictures and stuff like that. So you all, will, even if you don't get there, you'll feel like you're there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, so um, we're going to sign off and it was great seeing everybody. Uh, good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.